Today on Inside the Issues, I speak with John Higginbotham on the subject of Arctic governance. Hello and welcome to this week's edition of Inside the Issues, a CG Online podcast. My name is Dr. Andrew Thompson. I'm an adjunct assistant professor of political science at the University of Waterloo and program officer at the Balsley School of International Affairs. Every week we're joined on the program by an expert in global governance, international public policy, or some other aspect of international affairs. Today my guest is John Higginbotham. He is a senior fellow here at CG and at Carleton University and a former senior official with the Government of Canada. And he's here with us today to talk about Arctic governance. Welcome to the show. Well, it's a great pleasure to be here. To begin with, how is the Arctic changing? Well, that's a subject that's uh, of remarkable I th interest uh, to, I think it should be of interest to all Canadians. The number one fact uh, is the fact that the Arctic Ocean is gradually melting. It's melting very quickly in geological terms, i.e. over the last 30 years, the average uh, ice coverage of the Arctic Ocean has diminished dramatically year by year. Uh, it's still ice covered, and we have to remember that the Arctic Ocean is just that. It's an ocean covered by a layer of ice, not like Antarctica, which is, of course, a huge continent covered by very thick ice. Right. The ice is not so thick in the, uh, in the Arctic, you know, three, four meters deep at most. Uh, it's been seen as a, as a very important barrier to commerce and travel uh, over the years, over the last centuries, and also uh, as part of the life of Inuit people who use the ice as a, as a place to, to live upon. Uh, but the I Arctic ice cap is melting, and that's got profound consequences for many dimensions of Canada's Arctic policy. So just picking up on that, what does it mean for Canada's Arctic? Well, it means that particularly the, it's, it's the effect of global warming, which is particularly marked in the Arctic. The Arctic Ocean is warming three or four times faster than anywhere else on the planet. Paradoxically, the Antarctic Ocean is remaining cold, mm -hmm. but it's opening up the season for shipping. It's opening up uh, the possibilities of mineral exploration. It's uh, going to have important effects on the, the lifestyle of the Aboriginal peoples who live in the north. And it's opening up, so it's opening up opportunities as well as problems. The same global warming is causing climatic changes and is changing, uh, having a, a negative effects on the, on the shorelines and on the communities of people in the Arctic. But the important thing to note is that the Arctic ice cap is melting and that there's going to be increasing maritime activity in the Arctic over the next 30 or 40 years. And how is Canada addressing these issues at the moment? Well, we have a, we've had a pretty impressive uh, Arctic and northern policy in recent years. The Prime Minister has shown great symbolic interest in the Arctic by visiting there a number of times. He visits there each summer. Some good announcements have been made in terms of icebreakers and Arctic patrol vessels. However, and, al and also another positive feature is the devolution of uh, Im responsibilities to some Canadian territories. Right. Uh, however, I would say that the overall response has not been entirely adequate to the magnitude of the challenge. I believe that uh, we are going to face an entirely new and unprecedented situation in the Arctic, and it's time for a new, a fresh look at Canadian Arctic policy as a country, in our bilateral partnership with the United States, and in our, in our partnerships and understandings with other Arctic nations. That raises the broad question of the international governance of the Arctic. John, could you say a little bit about this notion of devolution uh, in the Arctic? Uh, Canada properly puts great weight on the rights of Aboriginal people 
and on the rights of people who inhabit the Canadian North. That is, it's a very important part of Canadian policy and uh, that's reflected in our policy of devolving responsibility to the territories. Now the territories are not provinces, they don't have the same rights as provinces, but they have increasingly are having important responsibilities. The Yukon has, is the most advanced of the three territories, largely because of its uh, uh, early history, close links with land links with BC and uh, Alaska for historical reasons. So it has near provincial status, that particularly in control of its own natural resources. The uh, Northwest Territories is next in line. Again, it's bigger, it's more, it's less developed, but the government has recently signed a devolution agreement right. with it, assigning certain responsibilities and rights to transferring them from the federal government to the uh, government of the Northwest Territories. The third is the uh, territory of, of Nunavut, very large, relatively underdeveloped. It has no land links with the south. It's all maritime or air. Uh, and they are beginning negotiations with the United St with the Government of Canada in respect of uh, its rights over its own resources. However, a good deal of the rights over resources have already been transferred indirectly to Nunavut through the land claims agreement, which has been reached with right. the Inuit people in the north. So they have extensive rights and powers. Uh, for the Inuit of Iqaluit, and they compose about 90% of the population. Great. Thank you very much, John. When we come back, I'd like to uh, focus the discussion on the international context. We will be back in a moment with John Higginbotham. You've been watching or listening to Inside the Issues, a CG Online podcast. Look for us online at cgonline.org, on Facebook, on YouTube, and on Twitter. Welcome back. John, as you know, relations between the West and Russia are deteriorating quickly over Ukraine, and this has implications for Arctic cooperation. Is Canada sacrificing its Arctic interests over the issue of Ukraine? Uh, I wouldn't put it clearly as an alternative like that, but there are going to be, I think, rather serious consequences uh, for the Russian bad behavior, at least uh, in the Ukraine, on Arctic cooperation. I'll just say a word about Arctic governance. There's a rather important but fragile set of understandings and institutions that have evolved in the Arctic since the uh, collapse of the Soviet Union. The first is the Arctic Council, which has been there for about 20 years. Uh, the Russians, Finns, and Canadians all claim kind of ownership over the idea of an Arctic Council, but it's the, it has eight members, including Russia, and what is completely clear is that Russian cooperation was essential uh, for its creation and essential for its continued development. Uh, the Canadian government has obviously uh, and rightly reacted very strongly to this kind of creeping velvet invasion of the Ukraine by, uh, by Russia. Uh, we're in the midst of the crisis and we have nowhere, do not know where it will lead. Right. If there's no diplomatic solution, it could turn into a a new civil war like in the Balkans right. with very unpredictable consequences on everything. For the moment, Canada is not participating or encouraging certain Arctic Council activities as a signal to, to Russia, but we are the chair of the Arctic Council this year. And as, as hosts of the Arctic Council, uh, I think that there's a recognition that this is there's certain responsibilities on Canada to keep up this multilateral institution. There have been many excellent bridges built with Russia over the last 20 years through the Arctic Council and other, other organizations. And it's in our interest to try to preserve what is good and uh, 
also at the same time signal that uh, the current uh, situation in the uh, in the uh, in Ukraine is is very difficult for the West to tolerate. Right. And building on this, Russia has begun to arm its its Arctic. Hillary Clinton has called on the Canadians to unite its armed forces to confront the Russians in the Arctic, if need be. Should we be worried about a militarized Arctic? Well, uh, when I started thinking about the Arctic, I always pointed to two great facts that had happened over the last 20 years. One was the melting of the Arctic Ocean, right. and one was the end of the Cold War. Sure. Unfortunately, the melting of of the war of the uh, of the Arctic has also produced these ghosts from the Cold War, and what you have is the issue of intent, right. and what it does, will this all mean? It raises the question of trust, and I believe that there is going to have to be a two-track policy towards Arctic uh, development in the next few years as trust is rebuilt. One is a security deterrence approach and the other is uh, trying to continue to build uh, uh, the cooperative mechanisms over peaceful development uh, that are in the interests of all the Arctic states, particularly the Arctic uh, coastal states. Now there are, the problem is that the Arctic Council is a relatively fragile institution. There's no Arctic treaty. Uh, we have other important Arctic understandings, for example, how to deal with the delimitation of the continental shelf, and particularly the extension of the continental shelf into potentially waters uh, or depths disputed between Canada and Russia. I was very optimistic about that previously because of Russia's good behavior in, say, uh, developing a, uh, a uh, uh, coastal boundary treaty between Norway and and Russia, but at the moment there is there is a good deal of chest thumping going on. Russia has been preparing, has been investing an enormous amount in the Arctic for the last ten years or so, into the northwest, into the northern sea route, and into large scale uh, gas and oil developments in the Arctic. Again, I saw that as an as an example of. Uh, peaceful competition right. and something that Canada should look at as a, a model for its own e economic development in the north. Right. But at the moment I think um, it, we have to be prudent and we have to walk on two legs, which is right. both deterrence and detente. Right. Thank you very much, John. We will be back in a moment with John Higginbotham. You are watching or listening to Inside the Issues, a CG Online podcast. Look for us online at cgonline.org, on Facebook, on YouTube, and on Twitter. Welcome back. John, I wonder if you might talk a little bit about your own research, and you've held uh, stakeholder meetings in Canada's north, in Yellowknife and Iqaluit. You've traveled uh, to Scandinavia, to Moscow, to talk about the Arctic. What have been some of your findings? Well, I'd say there is uh, a broad consensus among Canadian stakeholders, whether they're residents of the North or Inuit organizations or shipping companies, that there is a serious lack of infrastructure right. for Canadian maritime activities in the North. The Arctic, our own Arctic is surprisingly poorly charted. The aids to navigation are rudimentary. We have, our Coast Guard does an excellent job with the resources it has, but it has very limited resources seen against the, the size of the Arctic and the lengthening season in the Arctic and the increased number of vessels that are passing through the Arctic during those months where the uh, ocean is open. For the moment, our, um, our uh, Arctic navigation season is short. It's mainly concerned with uh, 
resupply of small communities that have no other land access, for example, in Nunavut. So special ships come in to, with uh, up on pulling, pulling barges up on beaches, very primitive, very, very uh, unsafe. Right. Uh, and uh, I think there's a broad consensus that much more needs to be done in respect of uh, Canada assisting Arctic navigation. Now this is primarily for destinational shipping, which means support of, uh, of, of mining and petrochemical projects, which are not developing very quickly. There are a few small projects up there uh, for uh, resupply of communities, for uh, potential growth of a fishing industry in the north, which will right. be a very important source of work for people in the north, and for cruise tourism. So there are a number of smaller cruise ships which go up there. So for, for tho that reason, there's a reason, reason to invest more in the Arctic. I should say that these are uh, pan-Arctic investments. We can't just download responsibility from the federal government to the three territories, all with very small populations, and expect them to bear the full weight of, of nation building. These are, should be, there should be broad national policies in support of uh, Arctic maritime, a new marked Arctic, Arctic maritime economy, and also in terms of closer cooperation with our neighbors in Alaska, in terms of energy development, mineral development, and safe shipping development by developing Arctic marine corridors. Right. So there's much, much work to be done up there. And uh, that is the message I heard again and again from private sector, government, local territorial government, Aboriginal uh, companies, and so forth uh, uh, in, the, in the round tables that I've been holding. Right. And what can Canada learn from other countries that are engaged with in the Arctic? Well, there's a lesson in Russia. They have put a, we, we, we don't want to do it in the same way and we won't mobilize the same amount of resources. But while we have been generally an inward looking Arctic policy, right. generally driven by issues of equity and identity, uh, in total contrast, Russia has invested billions of dollars in, in nuclear and non-nuclear icebreakers, uh, in uh, road and rail systems f serving Arctic ports, in extensive uh, development of natural gas resources, which will be taken by icebreaker tankers to Korea, for example. Uh, all of this is seen as part of the responsibilities of the national government in terms of nation building. So that's not necessarily a model for Canada, but that's what the competition is doing. And that raises to me the issue of why we, we tolerated before the problems in the Ukraine Russia's almost complete technical hegemony over uh, the northern sea route, right. uh, which is intended to be a a complement and invent eventually a competition to the Suez Canal. It, Arctic shipping is critical because it reduces the distances between uh, Europe and East Asia by about a half right. instead of going through the Suez Canal. The Northwest Pass, they are actively promoting that. They've set up uh, administrative organs, they've invested uh, billions of dollars in resources other foreign partners, particularly Scandinavian and other uh, foreign oil and gas companies are all investing in the north, whereas we are doing relatively little. Right. We don't promote the Northwest Passage as, a, as a, an international seaway, right. even though uh, a ship called the Nordic Orion went through the Northwest Passage on its own last year, carrying coal from Vancouver to, to Finland. Wow. It went through when, the, when it was open, and it did so making money, getting insurance, and not restricted by issues of draft, which is some, what some people say is the, is the Achilles heel of our Arctic uh, 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 Northwest Passage. So I believe there should be the beginnings of attention to Canada 
and the United States promoting the Northwest Passage as a uh, strategic alternative to dependence on the Russian northern sea route. Right. Thank you very much, John. When we come back, I'd like to wrap up by talking about your thoughts on the future of the Arctic. We will be back in a moment with John Higginbotham. You are watching or listening to Inside the Issues, a CG Online podcast. Look for us online at cgonline.org, on Facebook, on YouTube, and on Twitter. Welcome back. John, I wonder if we might end the show by talking about what you think are some of the most pressing governance challenges going forward, either for Canada or internationally. Okay. Well, I, I think our broad objectives in the Arctic are quite clear from Canada's point of view. We want sustainable economic development. We want the rights of Aboriginal peoples recognized. We want partnership with other country, Arctic countries. We want prosperity, peace, and so forth in the Arctic. The, up until the uh, problems with Russia, I'd say progress was being made towards all of those goals. To the Arctic Council itself, through the International Maritime Organization in respect of a polar code for ships to ensure safe shipping, uh, in terms of uh, United Nations processes for uh, dealing with potential bilateral disputes over, uh, over subsea resources, over territories, over, over the uh, areas, for example, that might come into dispute between Canada and Russia. I'd say the progress was excellent there. But now there is a problem, and the problem is one of trust. Uh, that, to me, is the international objective. Uh, there had been talk of turning the uh, Arctic Council into a, a true international organization, a treaty organization. I don't think that's going to happen for a while. Uh, we have to do a great deal in terms of uh, developing our own Arctic, in terms of uh, uh, recognizing broad federal responsibilities for pan-Arctic maritime and economic development. That is partially met through devolution and treating the looking after grants and contributions to the territories, but that's not how the Canadian Pacific Railway was founded. Uh, all of the big infrastructure projects in the south, highways, railways, airports, ports, all have reflect large amounts of money or federal guarantees. That same nation building approach, I think, has to be adapted to the Arctic because of the growth of the of open Arctic waters up in the Arctic. We want a, a new maritime economy could emerge there. But at the moment, there is no, I'd say there's not much planning for that. We're, we're, highly, we're a highly decentralized country to the, to the territories. We're highly fragmented in terms of responsibility in Ottawa, and the government's main attention at the moment is is on deficit reduction. Sure. I only hope that uh, they can uh, uh, address some of these issues of Arctic maritime development with the same energy once the uh, once the bu budget deficit is solved. Right. So just to wrap up, looking into your crystal ball, what might the Arctic look like 20 years from now? Well, it's not, uh, 20 years passes relatively quickly, I've sure. discovered. Uh, and uh, I think we have to really start thinking of the Arctic as a, as a kind of maritime economy, more like, uh, more like our maritimes, or more like Norway, right. where we have long seasons of open water, with many changes in shipping, fishing, tourism, and so forth. Uh, we, need, we need to work hard to make uh, shipping safer and to l extend the season and to set up some equivalent, though not the, same, not the same completely statist way, as the Northern Sea Route Administration. We need, we need rules, we need safety, uh, we need to uh, uh, control and encourage Arctic shipping that meets our uh, environmental and our economic needs. Right. John, this has been absolutely fascinating. Thank you so much for being on the program. Oh, it's been a pleasure. 
and thank you to our audience for tuning in. Please join us again for another episode of Inside the Issues, a CG Online podcast. Look for us online at cgonline.org, on Facebook, on YouTube, and on Twitter. Today on Inside the Issues, I speak with John Higginbotham on the subject of Arctic governance. Hello and welcome to this week's edition of Inside the Issues, a CG online podcast. My name is Dr. Andrew Thompson. I'm an adjunct assistant professor of political science at the University of Waterloo and program officer at the Balsley School of International Affairs. Every week we're joined on the program by an expert in global governance, international public policy, or some other aspect of international affairs. Today my guest is John Higginbotham. He is a senior fellow here at CG and at Carleton University and a former senior official with the Government of Canada. And he's here with us today to talk about Arctic governance. Welcome to the show. Well, it's a great pleasure to be here. To begin with, how is the Arctic changing? Well, that's a subject that's uh, of remarkable I th interest uh, to, I think it should be of interest to all Canadians. The the, the, it's, it's the effect of global warming, which is particularly marked in the Arctic. The Arctic Ocean is warming three or four times faster than anywhere else on the planet. Paradoxically, the Antarctic Ocean is remaining cold, hmm. but it's opening up the season for shipping, it's opening up uh, the possibilities of mineral exploration, it's uh, going to have important effects on the, the lifestyle of the Aboriginal peoples who live in the north, you know, three, four meters deep at most. Uh, it's been seen as a, as a very important barrier to commerce and travel uh, over the years, over the last centuries and also uh, as part of the life of Inuit people who use the ice as a, as a place to, to live upon. Uh, but the I Arctic ice cap is melting and that's got profound consequences for many dimensions of Canada's Arctic policy. So just picking up on that, what does it mean for Canada's Arctic? Well, it means that particular number one fact uh, is the fact that the Arctic Ocean is gradually melting. It's melting very quickly in geological terms, i.e. over the last 30 years the average uh, ice coverage of the Arctic Ocean has diminished dramatically year by year. Uh, it's still ice covered and we have to remember that the Arctic Ocean is just that. It's an ocean covered by a layer of ice, not like Antarctica, which is of course a huge continent covered by very thick ice. Right. The ice is not so thick in the, uh, in the Arctic 